The largest of all of the arthropod groups is the insects, and this makes up a subphylum which is called Hexapoda. Now it's known from fossil evidence that insects have been around since the Devonian period, so that's over 400 million years ago insects initially evolved. We've seen several waves of adaptive radiation, and one of the things that first gave rise to a lot of different insect groups was the evolution of wings. So we know that the wings provided a great advantage to a lot of insect groups, and we saw a lot of diversity once those did evolve. And then we also saw a great range of diversity evolve along with the flowering plants. So along with the evolution of the flowering plants, that provided a lot of new niches for different insect groups. So if we talk about some of the major characteristics of insects and what makes them different from some of the other arthropod groups, First of all, they do have three body sections. Those body sections are going to be the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Many of the insects are also going to have wings, so they're going to have one to two pairs of wings, and those wings are going to be coming out of the thorax section. We're not going to call those wings true appendages because they're just going to be an extension of the exoskeleton. That means they're going to be made up of chitin because they are coming from the exoskeleton. And we know that from the fossil record, there was just one event where we had the evolution of wings. So they did evolve just one time in evolutionary history. If we look at an example of an insect's body plan, we can see here at the top that we do have the three body sections or body parts to the insect. We have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And our insects are also going to have fairly complicated compound eyes. Now other things that we want to point out on this slide is that if we look down here, we do have the cerebral ganglion. So that would be the brain section of the insect. We're also going to have what are called malpigian tubules. Those malpigian tubules are going to be used for waste removal. So these are for removing waste. Another thing that's unique to the insects is the tracheal tubes. These tracheal tubes are going to be branch tubes or networks that are going to help to carry oxygen throughout the insect's body. They're going to open directly to the outside using some pores that are able to open and close. And those pores that open and close are what we call spiracles. Now, if we go through and we talk about the um, changes in the body of the organism over time, many insects go through a period that's called metamorphosis. This metamorphosis can be complete or it can be incomplete. So the top picture here is what we would call an incomplete metamorphosis. And it's incomplete because we're not seeing um, different habitat, different um, overall body shape and design from the larva stage to the adult stage. So in this case, we have grasshoppers. The larva just look like small grasshoppers. So the body proportions may be a little bit different, but overall it's still recognizable and that it is very similar to the adult form. Now on the bottom here, this would be what we would in, um, contrast call complete metamorphosis. With complete metamorphosis, the larva is going to be completely different from the adult. So typically they look different, they um, eat different food sources, they have a different role. So the larva is going to be for feeding primarily, and then the adult form is going to be for reproduction. So here we're seeing an example of a butterfly. Um, in this case, it doesn't look like a butterfly, it's a caterpillar because the larval or pupa stage of butterflies is a caterpillar. It's going to feed on leaves and grow, and then the butterfly itself is going to be specialized for the reproduction. If we take a closer look at that, here we just see the different stages of butterfly metamorphosis. Again, this is a complete metamorphosis. I notice again, the caterpillar is completely different from the adult butterfly. So they're not even really recognizable as the same type of organism at all. Now, as far as the insect orders are concerned, there are a lot of different orders. Um, we have the bristle tails and the silverfish, 
And those are not quite as recognizable as some of the other insect orders, but those are the ones that don't have wings. So we just have a few insects that don't have wings. And then when we move on to talk about the winged insect orders, there are a whole bunch of them. We're just gonna go through some of the um, larger insect orders, certainly not gonna cover all of them, but we just wanna point out some of the more um, significant ones. The insect order Coleoptera is the largest of all of the insect orders. So in this case, we have over 350,000 um, recognized species of beetles. So these are the beetles. And you can imagine that there are many more species that have not been um, very described or recognized yet. So they haven't been identified. As you can see on this slide, there's lots of different colors to the beetles. These are going to have two sets of wings and they do occupy different habitats and have different food sources. Some of them are going to feed on leaves, some of them are going to be decomposers, and we do have a number of them that will carry um, diseases to plants and then also some to animals. Another insect order that's quite large is the Diptera. Now the Diptera is, has 151,000 recognize, recognized species, and in this case, we're talking about the flies and the mosquitoes. These, um, one of the things that's significant about them is that they have very well-developed compound eyes. So their sight is very good, and they're also going to have a special pair of balancing organs that's going to help them a lot in their flight. Hymenoptera is what we typically think of as the stinging insects. This is going to be your wasp, ants, bees. These are insects that have a special organ that is for stinging. That organ is going to be located on the posterior end, and many of these are going to be highly social insects. And if you think about an ant colony, there are various social roles within that that those insects would be playing. Lepidoptera is one of the most recognizable insect orders that we have. This is the moths and the butterflies. This is one that does go through complete metamorphosis. So the larva stage is a caterpillar, and then the adult is a recognizable butterfly or moth that we're familiar with. Lots of different colors here. Um, one of the things that is significant about them is that they do have this, uh, what we call a proboscis, so this is kind of a long tongue that curls up, but this can be used to reach down into flowers and obtain the nectar. And then they also have little scales on the wings. You've probably noticed these before. If you've touched a butterfly's wings, you have a lot that kind of just rubs off of there. And then the true, what we call true bugs. So these are our true bugs. This is Hemiptera. So by true bugs, we're talking about stink bugs, what we call assassin bugs. Those are the true bugs. With these, they have lots of different shapes and sizes to them. A lot of really unique looking insects when we're talking about the true bugs. They do have two pairs of wings. One of those sets of wings is going to be fairly leathery. So that's one of the distinctive things about them. And then the last group that we're going to talk about is Orthoptera. Orthoptera, these are the crickets and the grasshoppers. This also includes katydids. And so just looking at these, um, these are ones that have hind legs that are very good for hopping around. So these are known for their jumping ability. If we move on to the last of the arthropod groups that we're going to go through, the crustaceans are going to be a group that is primarily living in water. This can be marine water, this could be fresh water as well. And these typically have a high number of specialized appendages. So at the beginning of the arthropod section, we looked at jointed appendages in a lobster. A lobster is an example of a crustacean. So lobster and crayfish, both of them have a total of 19 pairs of appendages. So that's quite a lot of appendages. Some of them are for eating, some of them are for walking, but 19 total. These are also going to have two pairs of antenna.
and they're gonna have, like we said, several pairs of appendages that they use for feeding or for mouth parts. If we talk about some of the different crustaceans, isopods is one of these groups. The isopods includes what we call pill bugs. So this is the pill bug on the bottom. Pill bugs you might know by the term roly polies. So these are gonna be terrestrial, but again, most of the crustaceans are gonna be aquatic species. This also includes what we call the wood lice, and there are some marine, there are some um, freshwater isopods. The decapods are the ones that are probably more familiar to you. This is going to include the crayfish, it's going to include lobster and crabs. With these, one of the things that's significant about them is that they're going to have what's called a carapace. And this carapace is a very hardened part of the exoskeleton. This is going to be hardened by calcium carbonate. And this is on the dorsal cephalothorax. So this is going to provide a lot of protection for these decapod crustaceans. The last group that we wanna mention here is what we call the copepods. The copepods are very tiny. We're talking about just plankton species in this case. And this is going to be a major food source for animals that are filter feeders. So we have a number of animals that we've gone through in this particular chapter that are filter feeders. And many of the times what they're actually pulling out of that water and feeding on is going to be the copepods. As we finish up this chapter, the last clade that we're going to look at is the deuterostomia. Deuterostomia can be broken down into the echinoderms and then also the chordates. We're gonna look at the chordates in the next chapter. So in this chapter, we're gonna talk about the echinoderms. There's a lot of variety when we just look at the clade deuterostomia to start with. So most of the grouping in this clade has been done based on DNA similarities. So there's not a lot of morphological similarities when we compare the different phylums that are contained within this clade. Phylum Echinodermata includes a lot of animals that are going to be very slow moving. They're either slow moving if they move or in some cases they're even going to be sessile. So they'll be attached to some type of substrate. They're not gonna be moving around at all. Visually, these include a lot of radial um, symmetric organisms. Radial symmetry when we're talking about the adults, but when we look at the larva forms, they're gonna be bilateral in their symmetry. So the larva, bilateral, most of the adults are going to be radially symmetric. These are going to have a thin epidermis and that thin epidermis is going to be hardened by calcareous plates. And by calcareous plates, this means that they have a lot of calcium in them. So they're going to be very prickly a lot of times when you touch them. And another thing that most all of them are going to have is what we call tube feet. And those tube feet are going to be for movement. They're also gonna be used a lot for feeding purposes. Altogether, we have five total clades that fall into the echinodermata. Probably some of them you'll be familiar with the organisms, organisms in them and then other ones you may not have even heard of before. But if we look at the most familiar one to you probably, this is the Asteroidae. And this one is going to include what we call sea stars. You may have called them starfish before. And then we also have what we call sea daisies. The sea daisies are probably not as familiar to you. So the picture here in the middle, this um, is the sea daisy. These um, organisms are going to have five parts that radiate from a central disc, and they're going to have two feet underneath those arms. Another thing about these is that these are able to regenerate parts. This is unique in the animal kingdom. There are a few other groups that are able to do some regeneration. This is one of the groups that can do it though. So there's a lot of research that goes into how these particular animals are able to regenerate appendages that have been lost. If we look at a diagram of the structure of a starfish, 
we do see those five arms that are radiating out from the center. Another thing to point out is that we do have the two feet all around the edges. So we can see that here. Again, these two feet are going to be for feeding and for movement, primarily movement when we're talking about the starfish. They do have a stomach, which is going to kind of turn itself almost inside out when they do feed. So they're going to kind of wrap themselves around their food source. And these just overall have a very prickly structure to them because they do have those hard calcareous plates that are gonna be found on the outside. The next group is what we tend to call the brittle stars. The brittle stars, they do have five parts that radiate out from a central disc, but notice that this is just a, it's a big disc, but very long skinny arms that are coming out from it. So they do have a different structure from the starfish or the sea stars that we just saw in the last clade. These are going to move by basically waving their arms around like a serpent would move them around. This group is going to include the sea urchins and the sand dollars. When you look at these, you don't see those five arms radiating out like we had in the last two groups, but if you look underneath them, they do have five rows of tube feet. So remember that the tube feet are going to be characteristic of this particular phylum. So we do have it here, even though the overall shape looks a little bit different from what we've seen already. This group, the crinoidea, this is what we call the sea feathers. This is one that a lot of students oftentimes are not familiar with at all. At first glance, these probably look like plants to a lot of people. These are going to be sessile and they will actually be attached to something. So this is the sea feathers. Um, I wanna point out that sometimes they're called feather stars. They can also be called sea lilies, just to point out some of the different names for them. So they are attached, and you can see those attachment points in some of these pictures here. We can see right here that they are attached to some type of substrate. The last of all the groups is a very unusual one this is what we call the sea cucumber. And it is a very long, um, kind of fat looking worm. It does have um, a reduced endoskeleton, so it's not gonna be so hard on the outside like we have with the other groups. And it's not gonna have the spines that some of the other groups have. We do have the tube feet though on the bottom of these. So we do definitely put them in this group and it's also been recognized to be part of this group by molecular evidence.